All right, welcome everyone. We're going to get started. If I can all have your attention, please. Uh, so we are lucky to have two fantastic speakers tonight. The first is going to be Bav Dylan. Uh, she completed her bachelor's degree at UBC in computer science and microbiology, after which she joined the bioinformatics training program in the lab of uh, Fiona Brinkman and at SFU. And so she's my lab mate, and it's my privilege to introduce her today. She's going to be um, talking about her work over the last few years, where she's been developing computational tools to study the fascinating world of microbes and genomic islands. Please help me welcome Bav. Okay, thank you so much for that introduction, Thea. Um, so today I'll be really briefly trying to explore the evolution of antimicrobial resistance using a tool that we've developed in our lab called Island Viewer 3. So to start, I want to introduce what are called genomic islands. So these are clusters of genes of probable horizontal origin in bacterial or ar archaeal genomes, uh, which means they can be shared between unrelated species. And these can include prophages, um, integrons, integrated conjugative elements, um, and they really contribute to the flexibility of microbes to be able to adapt to changes in their environment. So a lot of times genomic islands contain genes um, genes that encode um, alternative metabolism genes or resistance genes, and we've shown in a previous study that they also disproportionately contain virulence factors. So there's a lot of interest to try to identify genomic islands, um, especially when you're looking at pathogen genomes. So we've developed this tool called Island Viewer, which is a web-based tool for the identification and visualization of genomic islands, and it integrates three of the most uh, accurate genomic island prediction methods. Uh, the first two, Island Path Dimobe and SIGI HMM, which use a sequence composition based approach to uh, detect genomic islands. Um, so they look at uh, dinucleotide bias or codon usage bias. Um, look, look, they look for immobility genes. Um, and then the third method, island pick, is more of a comparative genomics approach where you're comparing your genome against closely related species to pick out the unique regions in that genome. So here I've shown you an example of um, what the output from this, um, the, from Island Viewer looks like. Um, so this is a salmonella genome. Um, and if you might not be familiar with microbial genomes, that uh, they are circular. So the circular plot represents the full genome. And the colored bars around the genome represent the genomic island predictions uh, based on the, the method they were predicted by. Um, and the red, the red bars simply represent the union of the, the predictions. So we've also integrated additional annotations into Island Viewer. Um, firstly, we've integrated virulence factors. Uh, we've collected curated uh, annotations from um, the major virulence factor databases that I've listed here. Uh, we've also developed our own pipeline to identify homologs of these genes in closely related genomes um, at the species or serovar level. We also integrate antimicrobial resistance genes. Um, and these have been identified using a tool called the Resistance Gene Identifier uh, from the developers of the, this CARD database. Um, and I've put a, uh, a citation there if you're interested. Um, and we also include what's called pathogen-associated genes. Uh, so these are genes that are only ever found in pathogen genomes that have been sequenced to date. And we've updated this analysis based on a previous study. Um, and you can see these annotations on top of the genomic island predictions as little circular glyphs. 
Um, and recently, we've also done a lot of work on improving our visualizations in Island Viewer. So we've developed a JavaScript library called Genome D3 Plot. And it has a lot of different applications, um, including eukaryotic genomes. So if you're interested, uh, look up our latest publication by Matt Laird um, in our lab. Uh, and I'll just give you a quick demo uh, if this works. So this is the main results page. If you look up a genome in Island Viewer, sorry, the resolution's not so great. Um, but on the left, you can see the uh, legend that shows you the different tracks. And you can turn them on and off dynamically. Um, and uh, you can also do the same for the annotations. Um, let's say you only want to look at the curated annotations. You can turn off the homolog tracks. Um, so it's really interactive. You can uh, click on a region on the genome. Um, and there's a, a horizontal view at the bottom uh, that corresponds, or it's synced with the top, the circular plot. Um, and this vertical view pops up that you can't really read it, but um, it shows you the details of the genes um, that are in that region. Um, and you, again, all the views are synced, so you can really explore your genome um, using this interactive tool. You can even search for um, your favorite gene of interest in this genome, um, and it'll show up in all three views. Uh, so it, we've really uh, built this as a, an interactive, flexible interface to visualize your microbial genomes. Um, so I've given you a quick overview of some of the, um, the data that's available in Island Viewer and the, the visualization tools. Now I want to talk a little bit about some applications of these data sets, um, some, some large-scale studies that we've been doing. So first, I previously mentioned that uh, we've shown that virulence factors are disproportionately associated with genomic islands. So we see roughly 5% of the genes on, in genomic islands are virulence factors compared to only 1% in the rest of the chromosome. And this difference is highly significant um, by looking at the p-value. Okay, um, but what we, what we also know is that we're also underpredicting our genomic islands, meaning that we might have a lot of false, uh, we may have some false negatives, um, and so this difference might actually be even higher. Um, okay, and we also tried to break this data set down in different ways. We looked at uh, what if we only looked at one genomic island prediction method, or what if we considered subsets of the virulence factors, like only the common virulence factors or pathogen-associated virulence factors. And we always saw this significant difference. There were always a higher proportion of virulence factors in genomic islands. So. Um, in terms of evolution, this actually made a lot of sense. So if we take an example uh, where we have this simple system of these little yellow microbes living in a blue host, um, and this one red microbe acquires a genomic island that encodes a toxin gene, which is a type of virulence factor. You can imagine as they grow and replicate, the toxin might actually kill the host. Um, so in this case, the virulence factor is conferring a disadvantage to your microbes because now they have to find a new host. So uh, the selective pressure is for these virulence factors to be associated with a mobile genetic pool so they can pop in and out of the genome. So they're not incorporated in the genome. So we're interested in looking at um, antimicrobial resistance genes and are they also disproportionately associated with genomic islands uh, because we know they are spread via genomic islands. And when we crunched the numbers, um, they, might, they actually surprised us. Uh, what we saw was there was actually a higher proportion of antimicrobial resistance genes in the native chromosome versus genomic islands and even plasmids. And this was significant. Um, okay, but I also told you that we are underpredicting genomic islands. So how can we um, improve this? Well, we also know that our genomic island boundary predictions are not perfect. So what if we used a more inclusive genomic island boundary and extended them by a thousand base pairs, which is approximately the size of one gene? Um, and we recalculated this, and what we saw was that there were relatively similar levels of AMR antimicrobial resistance genes um, in genomic islands and the native chromosome. And this was significantly higher than the levels in plasmids. 
And we also did um, another check to see if we had any bias in the genomes that we, uh, we were looking at. at. Um, so we used a less biased set uh, uh, where we took representatives uh, for where we had lots of, um, like for example, if we had 100 E. coli genomes, we picked one representative from that group um, to have a less biased genome data set. And we still saw this uh, pattern. So what is this telling us about the evolution of antimicrobial resistance? Well, if we go back to our example uh, and we look at these little microbes, but in this case, the red microbe acquires a resistance gene. We all know that when these microbes are exposed to an antibiotic in the environment, only the red guy will survive. Um, and what's more is that red guy will replicate and grow, uh, but any microbes where that genomic island pops out, they will probably die. Uh, and so there's a lot of selective pressure for these uh, resistance genes to be vertically inherited uh, and to stay in that genome, as well as to be associated with the mobile genetic pool. Um, but it's not always that simple. Um, so what we're doing now is working on trying to break this down, this problem down into um, looking at the different classes of AMR genes and are there associations uh, with with different classes. Um, and just really quickly, we we do see. Um, certain classes like uh, lincosamide resistance or macrolide resistance, these are more significantly higher uh, proportions in genomic islands uh, versus, say, beta-lactam resistance or aminoglycoside resistance um, is higher in uh, plasmids. We're also breaking it down uh, by uh, the mechanisms of resistance and looking at things like uh, efflux pumps are uh, significantly higher in, in the native chromosome. Um, so overall, this has been uh, the very first large-scale study uh, to look at trends of AMR uh, over a large collection of diverse organisms, uh, and hopefully I've given you a really brief glimpse at the evolution of antimicrobial resistance um, in microbial species. And I would just like to end by thanking my supervisor, Dr. Brinkman, um, and our entire lab, especially Matt Laird, Julie Shea, Jeff Windsor, who've all played a huge role in this project, um, and our collaborators at McMaster University and Andrew MacArthur's lab uh, for the awesome antimicrobial resistance data set, and Morgan Langell from Dalhousie, and all of our funding sources. Thank you. Okay, um, so the question was, why did, uh, was, what's the reasoning between the order of uh, putting the tracks on the, the visualization? There wasn't really um, any order for the three different methods. We just wanted the integration to be at the very outside of the plot. Yeah, so we, we prefer, just because the, all three methods are complementary to each other, there isn't one that's better than the others, so we really want users to use the integrated set, so that's why that, the integrated set is on the very outside. Yeah. Okay. So um, for, for our AMR data set, um, I'm basically counting um, how many AMR genes are in genomic islands and how many are outside genomic islands um, and just doing a Fisher's exact test. Um, so in terms of variability, I'm just looking at exact counts, so I don't see a lot of variability. Yeah. I haven't done that yet, no. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much.